Today's scriptural selection is from Ephesians 4. Sometimes even if we find it hard to believe, we must claim as truth the gospel good news. Together we find ways to tell deeply good news for all people by filtering our interactions through the lens of humility. Today's scripture speaks of, a, of approaching one another with all humility, gentleness, and patience. What we put into the world is part of the ongoing creation of the world. Notice the scripture doesn't say that unity requires agreement, but rather we are to cultivate the qualities that equip us to live in unity, regardless of agreement. Can we begin to believe this is possible? I, therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and parent of all, who is above all and through all in all. A word of God for our times. Thanks. Okay, so Grace this morning, if I get choked up, just, just give me a minute. Thank you for reading scripture, Todd. Uh, we sent Todd to a class yesterday, leading worship like in the United Methodist way, leading worship like a United Methodist. Uh, he spent all day Chatham and Chatham all day representing our church as we build him up to be a leader. And you just showed that. Thank you so much. Um, but I'm excited to see too what uh, what you're going to do for our church. And it sounds like maybe he's going to design worship and have a sermon in November. Maybe. No pressure, Todd. <laughs> Lots of scripture today, friends. Ephesians, James, Matthew, some wisdom. Therefore, as a prisoner of the Lord, I encourage you to live as people worthy of the call you received from God. Conduct yourselves with all humility, gentleness, and patience. Accept each other with love and make an effort to preserve the unity of the Spirit with the peace that ties you together. Put aside all bitterness, losing your temper, anger, shouting, slander, along with every other evil. Be kind, compassionate, and forgiving to each other in the same way God forgave you in Christ. Be quick to listen, slow to anger, and slow to speak. Word of God for the people of God. President Abraham Lincoln's second inaugural address. Was anybody alive for that in this space? <laughs> Not looking at you, Alex. I'm just kidding. So it was Saturday, March 4th, 1865. The Civil War would continue for another five weeks before Confederate General Robert E. Lee surrenders, and another six weeks before all the Confederate armies would surrender. But on that March Saturday in 1865, as Lincoln gave that speech, the war's end seemed imminent. 2% of the country's population had died, and although that sounds small, it was 620,000 people, the equivalent of 6 million today. Terrible destruction wrought on the nation one side against the other. Lincoln gave his second inaugural address in front of the US Capitol building. It was only seven minutes long, and you hope that's how long my sermon is today, right? He was trying to heal a nation that was torn apart. In the speech, Lincoln made multiple allusions to scripture. He noted of the North and the South, and he said this, both read the same Bible and pray to the same God, and each invokes his aid against the other. But let us judge not that we be not judged. 
Friends, Lincoln did not dismiss the sin of slavery for the sake of unity. He was quite explicit in his naming of it as unjust, worthy of judgment, and an offense against God and the enslaved. But he did so while recognizing the sin of both the North and the South. So we come to the last paragraph of this speech, and he says this, With malice towards none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle, and for his widow and orphans, to do all which may, we may achieve, and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. It was a remarkable statement, and the bloodiest and most tragic conflict in the history of our nation with untold suffering, Lincoln called the Union, the people of the North, to eliminate ill will towards the South and to show charity instead. Did I just say North and did this? Oh my goodness, oh, let's restart the day. North is this way, guys. <laughs> Lincoln called the people to the work of binding up the nation's wounds, to care for those who had suffered and named, as James did in the New Testament letter, to care for the widows and the orphans. This was the type of work that would bring about what Lincoln called a just and lasting peace. Americans believe that we're more divided than ever today. And note, I'm not talking about our government being divided, but about us Americans being divided. Our politicians are mirroring our own divisions. We've been divided over race and elections, same-sex relationships, and so many things. I don't believe another armed civil war is likely, but something very much like it could happen if we don't learn to exchange our malice for charity. So let's talk about the human condition, a struggle with conflict. So the human struggle with conflict is as old as the oldest stories of the Bible. Genesis 4 begins with two brothers, Cain and Abel, one a farmer, one a shepherd. The story pointed to the perennial conflict in the ancient world between farmers and shepherds. And in Genesis 4, Cain appears resentful of his brother Abel. Abel seems to have been blessed by God in noticeable ways in response to his faithfulness, and Cain feels slighted. And as his resentment grew, he began to hate his brother and determined that he would kill him. Cain killing Abel. It's a tragic story. It teaches us about our impulses, our tendency to resent and to divide, and at times to even kill. We all have a bit of Cain in us, and I know that's hard to hear. We make assumptions, we become resentful, we can grow to hate our brothers and sisters. I don't know about you, but there are people I simply don't like. I think of politics and there are politicians in Congress and people running for office that though I've never met them, I've never had a conversation with them, I find myself having a negative reaction based upon their political talk and their positions on issues. I find it easy to make assumptions about them. When I hear a negative thing about them from a political ad, and let's face it, it's all negative, or from a party or a news source, I tend to believe it because it confirms my own biases about that person. And that's the Cain syndrome at work in me. Sadly, the Cain syndrome infects our relationships with each other too, our neighbors, our coworkers, even our family. Our assumptions about others and our genuine disagreement with one another make it hard to practice charity for all. Instead, we have a propensity for anger, resentment, even violence and war. In the Bible, there are 200 references to war, another 500 references to killing, another 40 references to murder, another 100 to violence, and over 100 to hate. That's over 940 references to these all together. And this, beloved, is why Micah wrote, What does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? Micah 6, 8. And Jesus taught you should treat people in the same way that you want people to treat you. Or in older English, do unto others. Matthew seven twelve. The early Christians struggled with conflict 
Every one of the New Testament 27 books addresses conflict. It's why Jesus told his disciples to love your neighbor, love your enemy, and do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And why he emphasized again and again the importance of forgiving one another. It is why he said things like, don't judge or you will be judged. Or we talked about this last week. Take the log out of your own eye before you take the splinter out of your neighbor's eye. We see this conflict in the arguments the disciples had with one another, another over who was greatest. And Jesus pleading with God on the night before his death, Father, make them one as we are one. We see the conflict in Acts between Paul and his friend Barnabas, where Luke records the disagreement became so sharp that they parted ways. And in the debates Paul had with his fellow Jewish Christians over how to interpret scripture, Paul devoted four chapters of Romans to disagreements in the church. First Corinthians started off with Paul writing this. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in agreement and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same purpose. It is what led Paul to write in 1 Corinthians 13, and we can never hear this enough. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging, clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions and if I hand over my body so that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not do rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Because why? Love never ends. 1 Corinthians 13. Galatians begins with Paul's conflict with Peter and James. Ephesians was written largely about divisions in the early church and the importance of unity, where Paul wrote this. Conduct yourselves with all humility, gentleness, and patience. Accept each other with love and make an effort to preserve the unity of the Spirit with the peace that ties you together. Put aside all bitterness, losing your temper, your anger, shouting, slander, along with every other kind of evil. Be kind, be compassionate, and forgiving to each other in the same way God forgave you in Christ. It is why James called people to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger, and why 1 John tells us those who say, I love God, and hate their brother or sister are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love a God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this. Those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. So overcoming the divisiveness of politics. Let's apply all of this, all of this beautiful scripture to how we engage in divisive issues. Mike McCurry was a White House press secretary under President Clinton. He'd spent a lifetime in politics, but when he retired, he wanted to take a deeper dive into his faith, and he felt called to go to seminary. That's not what I would want to do when I retired, but he brought his life experience in politics and his theology together, and he became a professor of public theology at Wesley Theological Seminary in Washington, D.C. Mike was asked... What does he teach pastors about how to help their congregation to engage in divisive issues? And one key idea that Mike mentioned was the importance of listening, really listening to one another. Beloved, I know it's hard to listen to people with who we disagree with. It's easier to assume the worst about them, but the commitment to love includes listening. There are people who are truly bad people, but most people I disagree with, I find want to do the right thing. We just disagree at times on what that is. And an interesting thing happens when we seek to make right judgments that are fair. 
one of the key meanings of justice. And when we lead with kindness and when we listen with humility, is that we often find we're a bit wrong about that other person. And sometimes we even find a new friend. The importance of voting. We've been campaigning these last few weeks about doing unto others and to love your neighbor. Both guide us not only how we engage in politics, but who we vote for. But this does not take the place of voting. I want to encourage each of you to vote regardless of your political affiliation. Now hear me out. Often we get to the voting booth and we didn't know who to vote for. We have an idea of those major races, but not the lesser known races. Each election I try to find objective information on each candidate for myself and read up on the candidate on both sides and find those who most clearly share my values and vote for them regardless of party affiliation. There's a website, vote411.com. And it's like it sounds, voting information, vote411.com. You plug in your address and you're going to get information about all the races that are going to be on your ballot and information from candidates themselves in your area. And I'd love for you to use that information to guide your choices when you're in the poll soon. So I want to end where we began with Lincoln's quote. May we live with malice towards no one and charity to all, seeking to do the right thing. That's what it looks like to love your neighbor, to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with God, and to do unto others. That's the spirit that can bring healing to our nation and our own hearts. Amen.